recording now. Okay, recording is on. So, um, um, yeah, let's start. I'll try to make the notes in accordance. And Anton, if you could just help me with um, fixing this stuff, I might get wrong. And Anton, mm -hmm. would you mind if you're uh, adding, if you are here in the session from your uh, laptop, would you mind sharing the screen with the questions just for convenience? Oh, I'm on the... Oh, I can, okay. I can share the, it okay. if you need. Tyler, okay. I can share the questions because yeah, I've got it. Would be perfect, yeah, okay. would be perfect. Just for everyone to see the same, the same document. And Leia, let's start. I mean, who, who wants to start? I mean, um, there are obviously questions in the, uh, yeah, basically, um, uh, Kyle, for you to know, um, yeah, you know, everyone, first of all, Kyle is um, actually one of the two people who are leading effort on AI to, um, and in terms of data maintenance, data sets, uh, health, and all the related activities. So basically, here, they, they are very busy with that, uh, day in and day out, as far as I understand. And uh, Kyle, uh, on this call right now, there are uh, most of the uh, team leads we currently have working on particular challenges for you know this um, this activity, cool. and uh, so we, we we didn't we didn't join a lot of other people just to keep the audience controllable, let's say. But I think that the the people on this call are aware of most of the questions which are uh, raised within the teams uh, on a daily basis. Okay. So yeah, let's start and. Um, Anton, would you like to um, technically facilitate what was to be the first questions? You know, for, I would appreciate your help on that. Uh, so, like, so since we have a list of questions from the community, so essentially we're just like voicing them, etc. And we okay. also have the people. So let's start with: Do anybody like in the audience right now have the questions to Kyle? Okay, no. let, let's start to the list okay. then. Let's yeah. start with the list. So, so do you uh, want to read the list, Anton, or? Yeah, yeah let's do so. Okay. Any, okay, any, any, plan, any, any plan changes to the data sets, um, just briefly, so that we understand where, where, it, where it's all, all moving direction overall, you know? Yes, um, so um, currently, the, what we're focusing on for Core 19 is, um, we're trying to move to daily updates. That's sort of mm. the one big thing. Um, one big request that we've gotten. Uh, to move it to daily updates, we've had to build out some pipelining stuff, um, like reuse some semantic color pipelining stuff. And so the sources of the papers will also change somewhat, um, just because so that they, instead of pulling directly from like disparate sources and trying to harmonize them into one unified thing on a daily basis, um, we're repurposing more and more tools from Semantic Scholar to do this. Mm -hmm. um, so daily updates should be coming fairly soon, um, but I'm trying to do some quality checks to see if like using the different pipeline source, the sources um, causes some sort of fundamental change in like the papers that are included in the data set. I don't think it will. Um, that's one big change. Um, and I guess like this Friday will be the release that sort of pilot tests that transition with the new sources. And so we'll see what happens there. Um, beyond this, we're looking at um, sort of our most requested features. Uh, and this includes tables. Um, yeah, so uh, tables we're trying to add soon. Uh, what we were, we're currently working with about three to four different tools that can provide tables, um, two of which aren't publicly available. They're like through partnerships and, and such. Um, so we're working out sort of contractual, like, 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 <laughs> um, what is it called? Mm -hmm. uh, administrative stuff uh, to see okay. if we can use that. Um, and for each of these, uh, one of the tool is public and then the other one is basically just like trying to release uh, raw XMLs um, from publishers, which was another avenue. If we can actually just get the raw XMLs of the papers, then the tables are well represented there. Um, but all of these things basically take, because they come from different sources, we need to work out sort of legal and administrative agreements around 
how to release that and then how to keep it up to date. And we're also trying to decide how we want to sort of consolidate efforts to make use of those tables. Um, so that should be coming soon as an addition, but we don't really know in what form um, mm -hmm. or in what mode of distribution uh, those will be made available. Um, beyond this, citations, incoming and outcoming, should also be, uh, be made available um, pretty much as soon as we have daily updates because of the pipeline that we're using. Uh, citations would also be part of that metadata now. Uh, citations would be linked to Semantic Scholar papers. Uh, and if you want like data for those particular papers, you can query the Semantic Scholar API for that metadata. Um, yeah, sorry, I have, I have them just this my notes. I had to put all of this together because we're, we're writing the, we're trying to put out like a little preprint that yeah, documents sure. these things because a there's a lot of like common questions. Um, da -da -da -da. Oh, actually, actually, Kyle, after this conversation, I think um, if, if you find beneficial to share this list of answers to questions, we will, we will do this with, you know, there's no problem. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, um, this, this is going to go up on our YouTube, so it's going to be accessible for everyone who might need it. Cool. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think the, the, those the, are the document itself, you know, just for these. Yeah. I think these are the main things. Uh, these are the main things that we are actively working on. And of course, we're just adding more papers and more full text as we find them. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the main things. There are several other sort of planned features, augmentations of the data set that we would like to do, but we don't necessarily have bandwidth for. Um, mm -hmm. And that's probably something that we might want to talk to you guys about um, since mm, okay. we had that last call where we talk a little bit about like what's like a good, what are things that we could sort of mutually benefit from. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I thought about that a little bit and I think I have some ideas. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but specifically to answer the question, I think those wouldn't, there aren't currently being actively planned for release. Cool. Um, okay. Next question, I guess. Yeah. Uh, just let me, let me, do a quick check. Maya, are you with us? I, I, I've seen you disconnected for some reason, so just checking. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, I just perfect. Lost the connection. No worries. I truly apologize. Um, no worries. I, have, I do have a question, actually. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, which is kind of, uh, it's a very general question. Maybe it's a little bit stupid. But uh, dealing like kind of closely with data sets, I was a little bit com confused on the logic or uh, by which uh, the papers were selected. Ah. Some, are, some are really viral disease uh, connected. Some are suddenly researchers on the children in a certain climate. So mm -hmm. that, that's not really kind of, you know, crystal clear to me and my team. Uh, what was the logic behind the grouping these papers together? So uh, the logic from grouping these papers together um, I can tell you specifically how we constructed it. So um, the, the data set is constructed from papers issued uh, via a query to PubMed Central. Um, and the query is specifically uh, like the strings, COVID-19, coronavirus, uh, and uh, 2019 NCOV, uh, SARS-CoV, MERS-CoV, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, these sort of terms uh, that were, I think we created from one of our collaborators uh, was basically like, these are the search terms that we probably want to start with for initial set. Uh, we issued this as a query to PubMed Central. We did notice that later on, uh, after the fact, that there are some papers that somehow matched that query, but didn't have anything to do with that. And I think there might just be some issues with like, the tool, I guess. Yeah, there's, there's definitely some papers that don't match because there's been ones about horses and dogs and cats yes. and so, there's some weird ones in there that okay. just, yes. yeah. That's okay, that's uh, uh, just a, a type of research 
where you have, for example, viral disease and a special species when you do a testing. But then there are some kind of a social uh, researches and mm -hmm. kind of a climate researches that have actually nothing to do with the viral diseases. And then I've got uh, are completely confused. Yes, but yes. Um, so uh, I think, so I can tell you what, like exactly what we did. And then there's like also some general thoughts about what should belong in the data set and what should belong out of the data set. So in terms of the specific thing that's in the data set, it's composed of articles from PMC uh, that match to that particular query when you, when you issue like a, a search on PMC. Um, it also comprised of articles from BioArchive and MedArchive curated by, uh, I think the BioArchive has a feed uh, specifically dedicated to COVID-19. So we're sort of defaulting to whatever they think is related to COVID-19. There's also a collection from Elsevier. We didn't really vet the papers that come from Elsevier. We, uh, Elsevier basically made open a collection of articles that they've deemed to be related to COVID-19 under their specific license. And we've harmonized that, uh, but we've also found like papers under that set to also not be particularly related. Um, and then there's uh, finally the set from the WHO. So WHO has a COVID-19 database where they have hand curated articles about COVID-19. Uh, and those are being organized uh, and provided by CZI by matching them to like licensing information uh, via unpaywall. So basically the short answer is there's a lot of different sources that are providing uh, what they respectively think is related to COVID-19 uh, and we're responsible for harmonizing this. Well, because we've noticed that there are like issues with particular sources giving us papers that aren't necessarily COVID-19 or even like vaguely coronavirus, SARS, MERS related. Uh, one new thing that we're analyzing right now is with this upcoming release, we are pulling papers under a more strict uh, query uh, from Semantic Scholar specifically. So we'll see, and I'm basically in the process of doing some sort of analysis to, to see how closely those papers match the query versus the previous papers that were that were a part of the data set. Um, is that, does that help with like understanding like where these like random papers are coming from? Oh, yeah, that helps yeah. a lot. Thank you okay. so much. Um, in terms of the general larger question around what belongs in co core 19 or not, this is actually like a pretty open research question. So uh, we've been working with, we've been talking with people from uh, Microsoft research around around this question and this is one of those situations where um it's not like these are the papers that necessarily uh you have to look at and these and everything else is should be excluded um if you actually just traverse from citations uh like if you imagine like core, uh, core 19 and then you go for all outgoing citations from these papers because they cite other papers um you immediately start getting into like a set of papers that's like millions of papers. Um, and then if you go one more hop again uh, for citations, you go into like the tens of millions of papers. Uh, and presumably two hops away citations could still contain relevant information, but you can't possibly release. Like one, it's like just really, really difficult to, to, to talk to each uh, publisher to get an okay on full text release of millions and millions of these papers. And from a practicality perspective, if we release a data set that is basically like all of science and ask people to sort of work on that data set, that sort of isn't very helpful. Even if there is a chance that there's like some slightly related thing snippet in some like sort of disconnected paper. And so trying to find that right balance is sort of an open research question as to like, if your purpose is to study COVID-19, what is considered relevant? Well, we, there's, a, there's a technicality issue of like, well, we wanna make sure that we have the right search terms that we're matching articles uh, accurately to those search terms and including those. But what about things about like social distancing, uh, which probably won't exist, uh, which are probably totally relevant, uh, but you might have to look into like social psychology literature um, those aren't included in core 19, but maybe there you, there's relevant questions that we want answered and there's helpful snippets of text that we can extract from that literature. Um, but if we start including all social science 
like social psychology literature, then what else are we including? You know, like it's gonna get it's gonna get big quickly, isn't it? It's gonna multiply in its size. Exactly, and so almost. Yes, and so it, that, that's why I guess there's just like this really interesting research question around specifically for 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 an issue like COVID nineteen. What papers can we should we definitely include, and what papers can we afford to exclude for the purposes of basically practicality and making progress. Um, does, that, does that help also? That's like a, another, I don't have an answer for that. And that's something that sort of we're still actively thinking about. Um, oh, worry, some, helps, we're all kind of doing that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, it helps a lot. Um, and uh, it's the same uh, question we face. Like if it's relevant to a viral disease, then up to which degree it's relevant, mm -hmm. to which kind of researches it's relevant. So yeah, that's, that's a normal process. And thank you so much for explaining. No problem. Cool. Thank I you. actually uh, just published a paper pretty much about this topic where I, I went out uh, in and out two hops of citations and tried to rank the papers um, based on the relevance to a, a given topic. Um, so if there are more discussions happening, I would love to to be in a, on those. But I can I can get in touch with you, Kyle, uh, cool. later. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, I, I also had a, a specific question about the WHO data uh, papers um, mm -hmm. within Core nineteen. Yeah. Um, are those identifiable by looking at the WHO co covidence column and seeing if there's a value in there? Or that's is correct. There, okay. That's yeah. it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Perfect. Um, Shall we move to the next question, number two? Sure thing. Um, Form the test data sets, channel to coordinate and sharing. Initially okay. I think it's basically a question. It's a question around collaboration and not duplicating effort because we've quite a different, quite a large number of people are turning up and going some other group is doing something, but we don't want to duplicate the effort or the work because then I we see. can cover more ground. And I, see. I think we want to make sure that where and you are kind of talking from the same sheet so we don't double up work. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this also came up, this also came up, um, this also came up with this when in our previous chats. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I think th this is something we discussed, you know, because um, Corona Y team has um, enriched uh, the data set significantly. And remember we discussed whether it is possible to share the enriched data set, mm -hmm. but you know, for obvious reason, it's hard for you to do because you, you are lacking resources. And maybe what we can do as far as I understand this question is, is just make sure that we are, um, you know, kind of maybe enhancing the original data sets you have uh, or something like that. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I would definitely, um, if people want to contribute back to the original data set, I definitely uh, welcome it. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what's the best way to do this. So um, like creating a dedicated Slack channel that handles these sort of like, to, to be able to like discuss these specific mm -hmm. uh, data set changes um, seems like one good direction. Um, the other one, uh, and, and another thing to also do would be to add more and more of a code into some like open GitHub repo uh, that people can contribute to. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yep, so I think there's, that's basically, so basically I'm like pro uh, <laughs> incorporating changes back into the original data set. Um, well, just it, need it to figure out positive, how. It creates a positive feedback loop that improves the whole system and everyone's job gets easier, but how do we do it is the problem. <laughs> how can yeah. it be done is not, yeah. Yes. And how yeah. it's, uh, so, yeah. how it's so traceable what, what's the, be the best way for people, shall, we, shall, shall they just reach out to you in the join channel or, you know, just people to understand how they shall approach this? How about thing? this? Um, I think what we need to do is I need to put together the GitHub repo and start adding some okay. code there. Okay. Um, and then I can point you guys to the GitHub repo and then have everyone just contribute to that. Um, and then the other thing is probably to actually start this Slack channel. I would normally use my AI2 Slack, but it turns out that we have like these some 
like Slack has like some odd security thing where our IT group, group has to like approve every single person <laughs> that we have a, that we add to a shared channel. So I just decided to create a new one, a new workspace. So it was that, just like, I'm gonna say that would get clunky quick because our population grows quite yeah. fast sometimes. Yeah. So I think uh, just like a new workspace, um, I'll probably just do that. Um, and then we'll okay. we'll see from there. Um, I'm not I'm, super I'm, worried about. I guess I'm maybe a, personally a little bit less worried about duplication of efforts at this stage. Mm -hmm. um, it's always going to happen, it's, and there's I, I worry about like spending too much effort to then reduce yeah. the duplication, and it's like, right. yeah, um, yeah. And there's no point putting too. There's no point putting so much effort to stop duplication that the effort to stop the duplication is more than it's, the duplicated effort anyway. Yeah, I would. I would actually say that it's not. It's not. I would reformulate the question. Actually, it's not about duplication. It's, it's it's rather leverage, right? Because if if the team is producing something which might potentially be available to the wider community, how we made this accessible and the best way is to actually to collaborate with you initially, since you own the data sets. Mm -hmm. So that the original data sets, if, if the enrichment or additional code is, which is done is value, you mm -hmm. can just quickly expose to the public rather than for you to redo this on new level, right? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be okay. great. Yeah, perfect. So question number three then. Offers duplicated to fill text, da, 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 da. Expect every to navigate through the reference for one. Aha. Yes, that is correct. That is the assumption right now. Um, uh, I guess it continues. The question continues into the next line or something. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's yeah, a long. The next way. cell is the same. Sorry, I got to the end of that uh, question and I was like, "Is there more?" And yeah, I see. <laughs> I need to scroll. Mm. Include the broad, broadest possible set of data with the best available data. So, huh, I think maybe, so I would say probably not. I don't think we, we're, we will be providing a notion of best JSON because not, I think literally because we don't know. <laughs> Um, we just don't have the bandwidth to do the, to be able to build like junk detectors, um, or even like, even if there's like, even if beyond junk detection, if you have, uh, two corresponding JSONs and like one of them, the PMC parse misses something, but the other one, the PDF parse gets something like, how would we possibly know? Uh, it's just like, it's a, it's a substantial amount of work. And at some point we would like to be able to provide this um, so that people don't have to do it. But I think at some point we just made a decision where it's like, what we're doing right now is that's, it's already too much and we can't uh, also support this bit uh, reliably. So yeah, I think at this point um, for basically identifying what is the best JSON for each paper, um, sort of leaving that up to the community at this point. Mm. Um, now, if that's something that people sort of converge on like a good solution and want to contribute back, kind of building on question two, um, maybe. Uh, yeah, probably. That, that, that might be one, one direction. I, we probably wouldn't remove those JSONs just on the off chance that those are the, that can still be improved. Um, but we could add like a pointer to like, this is the, best community agreed method for identifying uh, what JSONs to use if you really only want to use one of them. And um, this is the pointer to which one that is per, per core UID, core UID. Yeah, I, I guess like contributing that back and adding that as a new metadata field would be reasonable. Um, does that answer the question? And also I think the, in terms of the logic, uh, we, have an, we have an FAQ on our discourse forum <laughs> that sort of details how we think people should be using the data sets. So I'm hoping, hoping that got people are reading that. Um, we, we, we were mainly hoping for people to work with the metadata file as 
uh, that sort of denotes units of papers. Um, yeah, I guess that's basically what is described here, which is just like uh, work from the metadata file for each row or for each core UID in the metadata file, there's a bunch of pointers to augmentations of that data just because we couldn't save them all in one CSV um, or we didn't want to save them all in one CSV. And then uh, you can pick and choose what text, what JSON text to, to, to also pull in at that point in time to do your inference. So. Um, Kyle, can you, can you restate what, what the forum, the discourse, uh, discussion oh, we're yeah. talking about? Oh yeah. Um, I hope it's linked to the main page, but it's, uh, I can just paste it into zoom has a chat thing, right? Uh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. If, yep. if possible, it would be perfect. Yeah. There it is. That. Thank you. Great. Yeah. So there should be a, there should be an FAQ. Um, and I've been adding to it as people have been asking questions. Uh, mm. so hopefully that answers sort of what, hopefully the FAQ answers any sort of confusion around why there are multiple JSONs, why there are multiple PDF SHAs, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, they're all artifacts because scientific publishing is really messy. Um, there's multiple PDF SHAs because PMC, for example, allows, uh, has a PDF for the main paper and also a PDF for the supplementary files. And we don't know which one's which. And so it's like, you parse both and you include both and hope people figure it out. Um, mm. uh, or when we do paper clustering, because we get a paper from Elsevier that is basically the same paper from PMC, we don't necessarily want mm. to include two rows for that because that sort of isn't very useful. So we, but the PDFs look slightly different because one of them has a watermark. So now the hash of that binary uh, looks slightly different. So it gets a different SHA. Uh, we have mm. to include both. Um, so. It's like things like that. Yeah, interesting. A lot of complexity just in, 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 in many basic things, it looks like. Yeah, it's a uh, scientific publishing is, is, is a little bit rough to work with. And I think, I guess the uh, core 19 has sort of exposed that a bit. Well, hopefully right. there might be some lessons from it and some documentation process that starts to become like standardized. I think, we'll see. yes, we do. Um, we have been talking about standardization to sort of support this, but this has been, a, this is like not a new thing. Uh, like people in the library sciences have been studying this for, for years. And it's, mm. it's a tough problem to, to, to come up with like a fixed schema for defining these are the fields for representing a scientific document, especially now with mm. pre-publishing, like pre-printing it's, it's, and people can upload multiple drafts, updated drafts of the same mm. conceptual paper, but with different content to the same IDs on BioArchive and MyArchive, at that point, like, do you even consider them the same paper anymore? Or what's the deal? Yeah. Yeah, that's complicated. Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, this is a great challenge for CoronaWide to, to tackle. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Make standardization <laughs> happen across the industry. Uh, okay. <laughs> maybe later. Let's stay with one problem at a time, eh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's like, see. With, let's do it 10 problems at a time, because it's even then it's still not one problem. Right. Uh, number four. Let me actually way. quickly rephrase number four, uh, because like some of the stuff already happened within CoronaWide. So we run into issues that Kaggle dataset platform has this limit of 20 gigs for, for the data sets like storage. And since we're enriching, we already like above that limit. And uh, now regarding the like AI2 and Code19, that data set is also kind of getting up and up in terms of size. So do you guys, is, is there a path forward what you plan to do in terms of how the Code 19 will get put into Kaggle community. Et I, I do not know the answer to this. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the extent to which we're doing the coordinating with Kaggle has been mm -hmm. around the provision of the Core 19 resource. Um, mm -hmm. Kaggle, I think, basically put a lot of this stuff together. Um, and the questions, I think they're handling, the questions are coming from the OSTP. Um, mm -hmm. and the curation of the evaluation, they're sort of the ones who are driving the evaluation and working with medical experts to do the evaluation. So in a sense, I, I personally consider this to be like Kaggle's task that mm -hmm. AI2 and Got other it. people are helping with. 
I don't really know the details of like the 20 gig limits. Um, well, it's it's a, just like limitation of a platform for our for for us as users to upload our data, etc. So I think for Core 19, if Core 19 becomes too big, Kaggle again has just could bump the limits on their end. But obviously, they can't do it for us. That's why it can, kind of becomes problematic on our end for coordinating where the data source, etc. Um, is there any other way to get Core 19? Uh, currently, can we just go directly to AI2 website? And oh yeah, I mean we host we host Core 19 our own website too. So yeah, um, okay. might be worth move. It might be if it's not already been done. It might be worth moving all the all the, the res, you know where it's coming from just directly yes. from the AI2. Yeah, team. I just rather than having it. the middle rather than the middleman that's not adding anything to it for us. Well. Kegel I mean, I mean Kegel's us, adding yeah. a yeah, adding yeah. the questions and stuff, which is which is definitely awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, but yeah, no, I mean, but we've, could... we've already got the questions now, so they're not really <laughs> okay. yeah. they're, they're yeah. not new questions for us. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, we have we maintain the um, basically the the way that we do the data sets uh, download mm -hmm. situation is we point them to this page, which is where we directly upload the data set, and then Kaggle I think basically pulls from that, reorganizes it, and then hosts on their platform. Okay, so let's move to the next question. Again, Mike added a lot of questions over here. Okay. Yeah. So uh, within Chrome OS, especially with, up, but... yeah. But anyway, so. Um, does it position... be lost to you? I think. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Need? Um, there are concerns I'll... about. I don't understand this question. I guess that feels like my opinion is that you could do whatever you want. So in, say it again. I guess my uh, position is like use whatever tool you want. I, I'm not. But regarding like uh, if we ask this question in the context of collaboration, right? Do you guys have some policies restriction in terms of what what is used regarding like how we process the data, yada, yada? Do, I see. That's my question. Um, we personally, I guess it's on a case by case basis. It's really tough. Um, we try to release everything um, from AI2 under like an Apache 2 license. Mm -hmm. So okay. any dependencies on that, we sort of want to make sure that they're also under a similarly permissive uh, open and source license. Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of why we've just ten tended to stay away from proprietary like enterprise software. Mm -hmm. um, plus minus special circumstances, uh, such as like PDF parsing. It might, it might just be fundamentally really tough to do it without like buying some yeah, expensive without. software, yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, I guess like in general, we try to go for like more permissive open access license tools. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, um, but do whatever you want, I guess. <laughs> no, no, I mean, yeah. Uh, we just yeah. again, it's just kind of like this guidance. We're trying to figure out what is the good way to pass I forward see. for our community. That's why we kind of touch and base this with, you know, obviously with with you guys. And so yeah, on. I guess like even on just because there's going to be stuff that uh, we're not going to integrate that's coming out of your community, and which is totally mm -hmm. fine because that's sort of like your community's own, like owned mm -hmm. con contribution thing, um, and my recommendation there is in the past we have we have had uh, software that was not open access, open sourced mm -hmm. uh, or depended on like more enterprise software and like within like months or even like a year, like maybe like worse, like a year, um, the other tools that had a more like open source, open uh, community around it uh, basically uh, surpassed like those other tools in terms of performance, mm -hmm. just because they had like a large pool of people working on it. So I would just lean towards anything you can community source. based. Yeah, yeah. anything oh, that is I mean, we, based. we we lean towards open as a general yeah. rule yeah. as a value system anyway, because we're, 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 we're very transparent and we're, we're very transparent in everything, not just the data the data and the creations mm -hmm. we have. We yeah. like record all the calls and people can see what we talk about. It's all very open. Mm -hmm. Uh cool. Uh so six. Now it's fairly settled. Which new papers are added and change each update? Oh, I I guess uh, so. 
just asking for greater specificity in the change logs because right now for the change logs we're just counting diffs uh, in terms of like these are the number of papers in each of these sets that have changed uh, added deleted and stuff like that so is mike requesting like just here are all yeah. the ids um maybe it's just something more specific i think we're starting to integrate um ids and referencing ids from the so i see um i don't know the i guess i don't really know quarantine last modified date so but i, I guess like I, I guess we already have the version tag though. Like, don't we already have a date um, for each of the versions? I, th yeah, I, think, I think like so. in recent version, something got added to that. Again, this questions get crowdsourced from like first week or something. So some of the uh, I see, questions I see. Okay. could be outdated. No problem. Yeah, yeah, that's no problem. Okay, I think, I, I, let me know if this is still a mm -hmm. problem. I feel like we have the versions now. And I, uh, yeah. and the change log should be sufficient. If you want like these specific IDs that are different, yeah. uh, I don't know if we actually want to do that because there are going to be specific times in which. Yeah. Um, so I can tell you yeah. like where where this pain comes from our end. Like yeah. every time the new like data sets get you know released, it's kind of like a like a huge frenzy for people to rerun everything they had. And some of our pipelines are already kind of generates like, you know, out of four gigs of data, you, you have like 20 gigs of data. So that, that is kind of a painful process for those folks. So some form of like, I mean, uh, synchronization needed to essentially how to make that process not to redo the redundant work that was already done and things like that. So like, I guess it comes from that end. Um, and so I'm, I'm actually kind of curious, can you give me an example of like what specifically is breaking from week to week? Uh, okay, I'm not the right person, but yeah, we'll follow up with that. Like, okay. Uh... I think in parts, we are hoping that like people expect, uh, yeah, I guess like the, to expect potentially breaking changes. Um, mm -hmm. Once it moves to daily updates, I guess on a day-to-day -day basis, there might not be anything that's fundamentally breaking. Um, okay, can you kind yeah. of expand on this with this like plan? So right now it's a weekly update. Uh, yeah. Now you got, when do you plan to transition to kind of nightly builds of data set? When? Uh, I yes. don't know. Uh, so but, but at the, the, the plan is there. Yes, the plan so, is there. Okay. Yeah, it should be in a couple weeks. Mm. I, I okay. Um, okay. This Friday is sort of a pilot test of like what the form of the data looks like. We've been trying mm -hmm. to, yeah, I guess it's hard for me to answer, uh, like to talk about issues around breaking changes mm -hmm. without knowing exactly what's breaking. Like yes. for example, are things breaking because the data set size is increasing? And then in terms of the, the provisions, like machines that you guys are using aren't big enough to support that. And so it runs out of memory. Like that's like one type of, thing to address versus yeah. schema changes versus there's a new type of paper with like a specific thing for which a regex fails on like those are all sort of different and so i don't quite know well that, to... that's definitely a compound problem it's both an optimization on our end our pipelines right and then again it's it's the input so will that discord what the discourse link that you like message in the chat is a good place to kind of follow up this plans to transition to nightly builds plans yeah. to do yeah yeah that would be great okay. Okay. um okay. if yeah if you want to have like very specific uh, this mm -hmm. thing broke because of this change from this week to this week mm -hmm. on this okay. like specific paper or something like that like if you can just like have those then i can look mm -hmm. at each one of those and, and figure out okay. what's what's happening there awesome um and then uh yep it looks like seven and eight are addressed right um so, so, yeah, thank you. And any additional questions, team? Just any, just any ask, questions? Which are not can there. I ask a quick question um, sure. about on the, the AI2 website that hosts the Core 19 data set? Yeah. Um, 
where it offers the metadata file, it also offers the Microsoft ID, uh, Microsoft Academic. Oh ID yeah. Mapping. Can you do? You, are you aware of exactly where where that's coming from and how you guys process that file at all? Because I know uh, I've been using a, a file hosted by Microsoft on on GitHub, um, and I assume that you're. I was not aware of that. Uh, oh. What's the file hosted by Microsoft? Um, let's see. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to have to find the GitHub repo. No problem. Okay. So, I, I mean, like, you can share that with me later. Um, okay. The, in terms of the file that's hosted on our end, um, that is basically we're working directly with uh, the Microsoft research team that handles the Microsoft academic graph uh, to get those IDs. I believe they're providing that they're providing the mapping on their end and we're hosting it on our end. And I think in the future, we are going to be keeping that as a supplementary dump. Um, the reason is because they are trying to do some like citational stuff uh, to point to like a larger set of papers that they think is relevant beyond core 19. Um, and it's just like, there's going to be two distinctive use cases, which is one is people working on this, the specific core 19 set. And another is people who want to actually work on this like much larger pool and are willing to like go collect that data themselves um, because we're not immediately providing it. Uh, we want to keep those separate. So we don't like flood the metadata CSV file with like a lot more rows. Um, so yeah, the supplementary dump, like we know about the supplementary dump from Microsoft that is on our page. I don't know anything about the one, the GitHub one that you're referencing. Um, okay. Um, I guess, yeah, can I talk to you separate about that? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, cool, I guess I had, if there aren't, if there aren't, um, any more specific questions? I had a couple thoughts that I had since sure. our last chat. Sure. Um, I guess pretending around working together on like something that's not necessarily duplicate. So mm -hmm. um, there are a couple things that we haven't been able to do. Um, and one of the major ones is around foreign language papers. Mm. So uh, there's a lot of literature in China, for example, um, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, but definitely being published in other foreign languages and our processing pipelines don't work well with non-English language text. That's mm -hmm. just the nature of a lot of the tools that we're using and, and also just like our expertise in being able to do like junk filters, identification of authors and, and whatnot, uh, authors, title, parsing, paragraphs and stuff like that. It's like, we know how to do this for English, and we can iterate on doing that for English. We just don't really know how to do this for a foreign language. And, mm -hmm. um, or even like papers that have a mix because there are definitely papers that have like a mix of like bilingual papers. Um, and so we're definitely missing, like we know for sure that we're missing uh, COVID, relevant COVID-19 literature because of this. Um, this is a substantial effort that I think we don't have the bandwidth to take on, but we mm -hmm. sort of know what needs to be done. So if there is interest on your side um, to working together on something in this space, um, I'd be happy to talk more with whoever wants to help out with that. Um, we have been in chats with the Internet Archive who are scraping a lot of the Chinese papers. Um, and the reason we want to do the scraping uh, now is because we know that these Chinese paper repositories for COVID-19 are going to be unavailable after May. Like they're taking them down. Um, are they locking them up basically? Yeah. And so if we want them, we want them, we need to get them now. Um, we probably want them. Yeah, we probably yeah, want them. Yeah. We probably want them. Yeah. And, A lot. Yeah. Yes. Actually. And so, and so that's why we've been talking with Internet Archive around, mm -hmm. around collecting these PDFs. And then first as sort of what the, the biggest hurdle to overcome. We also need to collect any sort of metadata associated with the PDFs, um, just because if you have the gold metadata, we don't have to worry about bad PDF mm -hmm. parsing. Um, and uh, we also want to collect licensing information because you know we have to adhere to like legal 
uh, restrictions on what we can and can't do with those with that data. Mm -hmm. um, so collecting all that data is, is a pretty substantial effort. Uh, Internet Archive is doing some, uh, if you guys want to help out, there's probably some coordination there around how to do that. And then mm -hmm. beyond that, um, processing the data is another substantial space, um, just because we don't know how existing tools work on those papers um, and where <laughs> the failures are. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's one of those things where um, just having a large set of people working on it will identify a lot of the problems more quickly than like me working at it mm -hmm. by myself or something like that. So, um, um, Is there a chance you would like to discuss uh, possible uh, extract and uh, rel uh, relevancy clustering mechanism uh, uh, with us? Sorry, can you say it one more time? Um, is there a possibility that like, uh, you are open to a discussion on uh, which uh, kind of methodology you use uh, to extract papers? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, like comparing to what we do? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we should totally, we could, we could totally chat about that. Um, that would be lovely. Yeah. So that is one space. It's just basically foreign language papers. And then the third thing after, that's kind of like the final thing after that is basically uh, wondering about how to get translations. And I think the translation space is very, very tricky. It's not even obvious to me that it needs to necessarily exist. Um, yeah, I imagine the, tra I mean, we're already struggling with the digitization mm -hmm. of, uh, the, the, like the digital yeah. translation of, of data. The language translation of, of scientific literature is probably just as complicated. I, I would say that like the, it's probably something we don't want to tackle outside of some sort of like expert crowdsourced translations bit. So we probably don't want to tackle this from an automation aspect, but from like a uh, I think building. I think it's uh, possible to actually co uh, cooperate our efforts uh, with a huge uh, tr uh, translators databases. And they would probably uh, like to take it as a fight against COVID-19 effort. So uh, probably, I think there's going to be two components, one of which is the language barrier uh, to be able to translate into, into all the languages. Um, and the other bit is actually maintaining the scientific, uh, like the correctness of the information, um, just because there's technical language. So like even English to English, like a non-technical, like I can't read any of the COVID-19 papers and really understand what they are. So I imagine right. the translation that preserves that is also difficult even if you're a native language speaker. So um, that's there sort of the- There are special communities, and there are special communities on that. Yes, that's, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, right. So that's probably a point of contact, I assume. Yes, yeah. Um, so I guess like that's sort of the, those three points, collecting the data, processing the data, and then translating the data are sort of three big areas uh, where we sort of have a lot of opinions on how to do it. And we know sort of who's been looking into this but we just don't have the bandwidth. Um, so maybe you guys would be interested in this space um, because it's definitely not something that we're actively doing mm -hmm. right now. Um, another area for this is uh, documents about COVID-19 that aren't scholarly in nature, that aren't uh, publishing, so published papers. So what we sort of know how to do at Semantic Scholar is process and handle organization of scientific articles so these are like preprints, public, uh, journal publications, etc. But there's a lot of information about COVID-19 that doesn't exist in scholarly articles. Um, for example, uh, around like testing, let's say. Um, early on, I guess like even still now, but like early on, especially like maybe like a few weeks ago, uh, testing was, was such a huge question and people didn't have time to write their uh, testing finding up in like nicely formatted worded preprints or they definitely didn't I have time to submit the journals. I apologize to interrupt you. Uh -huh. We've had a conversation about that uh, with the domain experts. Yes. And they claimed that unpublished works uh, might have uh, a tremendous weight. Yes, yes. Um, so that's sort of, uh, that's kind of what I was trying to, to, to point to, which is, uh, we know that there's a, there's a missing component here, which is we are 
handling a lot of the the scientific publishing bit, and I think a lot of the value will be, will, will be in processing preprints uh, and finding relevant historical literature that people can draw upon because there are still open questions. But in terms of like the very very recent, uh, like the most recent findings about COVID nineteen, that is not going to exist in preprints, and it's definitely not going to exist in articles that we have in COVID nineteen. It's going to exist in technical reports. Uh, maybe forum posts, maybe ran like blogs or sheets from various groups um, who are working on like on the field for this. Maybe they're just work in the in the form of notes that they're taking. And there so, are unpublished works that yes. actually are just a pending peer review and approval, and these works might be have a crucial influence because they are very recent. And that's none right. of the works are included. So that's one of the problems, absolutely. Yes, and so I think that's another space that we don't have bandwidth to collect. I think the collection bit here is, is the toughest bit because we don't know where they're, they're coming from. So we have a little bit of, like, we have a little bit of an easier prob problem to, here, which is uh, we can look to PubMed which has a long history of partnering with a lot of journals to collect information. So we just work, we interface with it via search. Um, we can talk to our publishers because we have a long history working with them, uh, which is why we have like the Elsevier collection. Um, but where are the notes or like the technical, like the technical reports or like the white papers being published, being like printed about like the, the most recent findings, like we don't know where they are. Um, so finding that, and then collecting it on a consistent basis is a lot of effort uh, that we just can't do, but maybe you guys could take on. Um, so that's another area that I think um, I'd sort of like to see some group working, working at that. Um, there is, um, let me see, that translation. I think those are the two biggest ones. I might have forgotten one, but those are sort of the two biggest ones on my mind right now outside of um, sort of general text processing uh, of the existing Core 19 data set, getting like fixes back into the original data set. Um, that's sort of like the other thing that's on my mind, uh, where it's like is much better if we can get a large community of people working on this as opposed to just AI2 doing this. Yeah. Okay, Kyle, uh, let us, um, yeah, thank you for, for responding to the question section. It's, it, it's very helpful to the community. and. Let us uh, internally regroup and return to you with the um, help uh, proposals for these questions. Cool. I, I, I'm pretty sure that we will be able to provide you with the, you know, kind of contribution on that. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. And yeah, perfect. All right. Uh, stay, stay in contact. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much and bye-bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yes. Amazing. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Kyle. Thank you again, Kyle. Thank you. Highly appreciate it. Thanks.